Okay, welcome to my stream again. Today is December, oops, December 7th, 3.24 a.m. <laughs> Daily art uh, for me, day 3,603. One step closer to 10 years. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, the same mountain scene that I've been working on for several days now. Really trying to figure this out. I'm really excited about it because I'm learning so much as I'm going through this process. I'm learning environmental design within um, digital painting. I went through this amazing course on schoolism called uh, environmental design. I forget what, exa what it's called. Anyway, it's a the environmental design course on schoolism by Nathan Folks, which is it's really good. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to implement what I learned from there. But today specifically, I realized that I made one of the biggest uh, mistakes that you can make within uh, starting your painting process. And that is not drawing out the painting process tremendously or drawing it out fully. So let's go into it. Oh, right at the beginning, my stream is having some, uh, some issues. That's okay. Usually those kind of clear up after a little bit. I am playing music in the background now, so maybe that is causing some issues. If it doesn't clear up soon, I will um, turn off the music. Hopefully the music isn't too distracting. Okay. Yeah, let me, let me try stopping the music. I'm not sure if that fixed anything. Nope. Well, that's the thing about streams, you know? It's real life, we never know what's gonna happen. Um, it's actually quite fun. <laughs> you never know what's gonna happen. Ooh, that color is really... Oh, I'm on the wrong paint layer. Okay, I should be on the right paint layer. No, not that one. Yeah, this one. There we go. Okay. So here's my mountain scene and what happened previously or what I did previously. Let me, I'll try and take you through some of the process that I went through at the beginning of this whole idea. I'll remove that and I'll remove this. And I started with this blank page in Krita. Let me, I'm going to close up some of these things or hide them all. And... So my canvas here is um, about 5,000 pixels wide, uh, 25 pixels tall. So that's two by one ratio and uh, about 300 DPI. So that's what I'm working with. You probably don't need that high of a DPI. It makes for a larger uh, canvas. And if you don't have a beefy computer, it's going to slow down things. So, the where I started was more kind of a block-in stage. So this is what I did. This is more like a value comp. Honestly, I probably could have done better if I had taken this, um, and this w would have been, you know, this little s small thumbnail sketch, and then just built something big from it. Um, that would have been you know, really the better way of starting this. But I, I kept with that and then I fuzzed it all out. And then I honestly, I just started painting on it. Um, and this, this, that doesn't even show. Interesting. Well, anyway, there's stuff there. So I just started painting on it. And eventually, when I figured out that I didn't have, you know, a really good understanding of this mountain to be able to render it faithfully the way I wanted to, I, I started to redraw it. 
and I, I did a whole live stream on redrawing this and getting the understanding of form. And then uh, last night when I was thinking about it, I realized, well, well, heck, I need to do that for the whole thing. I haven't, I haven't gained that understanding for the entirety of this painting. I've done this so many times through my artwork. I, you know, I, I keep forgetting. I need to have a list, uh, a nice checklist on the things that I go through for uh, creating a piece. And the very first one would be doing thumbnail studies and then drawing it out completely from those thumbnail studies, right? So today, I'm going to show you my entire process that I go through for looking at reference <clears throat> and determining what I'm going to draw and where. And we're going to be looking at a lot of imagery. I, I've said this on previous streams. Uh, I love look, you know, collecting imagery from other artists and getting it inspired by that. This is my folder full of artists, and I have a lot of them in folders. Some of these artists you've probably heard of, like Bierstadt, which I've shown before, Reppin, Howard Pyle, Van Gogh, of course, Frank Frazetta, Frank Brangwing, Edward Payne, Drew Struzan, Greg Mullins, uh, Joseph Clement Cole, <laughs> Goya, you know, all these guys. Um, and women. I have a few women. Cecilia Bow. Talk about <clears throat> an American painter that is not as celebrated as really she should be. Glass ceiling. She broke the glass ceiling early in the 1900s with just being a completely amazing artist. Anyway, not enough. Um, oh, Casey Childs. Oh, that's a, that's a man as well. Anyway. I don't collect enough women artists. I need to relook at that. So anyway, um, I love Beardstat, especially for this composition. Let me see, we'll pull all those up. And I'm gonna begin from, you know, stealing from Beardstat. I, you know, I, I say steal specifically because I'm, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be copying from Beardstat. But I will steal from him. It's like Austin Cleon's book, Steal Like an Artist. When you steal something, you take some principles, you take some ideas, and you kind of pull pull it into what you have, and then you you add what you have to it, and then you make it your own, right? What you don't want to do is copy. And that's where you take someone's painting, and you look at even a small portion of it, and you copy exactly what you see, and you put it in your painting. That's... That, in my opinion, I agree with um, Austin Cleon is not the best way to go. So, I'm going to steal some stuff from Ar Albert Bierstadt, who is absolutely amazing. And um, probably this painting here. Let's look at this painting. The, um, I was looking at this before. And, and <clears throat> you know, from multiple ideas for pieces. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit D. Oh, by the way, this is... Um, this program is called Image Glass. Image Glass, I M A G E G L A S S, and it's wonderful for, you know, a lightweight image viewer. I use it on Windows. I'm not sure if it's on Mac, so sorry about that if you have a Mac. Um, I'm sure that Mac or Apple has something just as good, but maybe even better. So. Let us all know if you have a Mac or a Windows machine in which you prefer. Actually, the painting program that I'm going to be working in. Oh, this is wonderful. Look at this cliff here. See, I can, I can pull from this, uh, get some ideas uh, of a cliff face, because in my piece I have a big cliff face uh, as well. Pull some ideas from that. I like the waterfall that's in there. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is work, you know, back to front uh, on this piece. What I'm also going to look at is I have an area. 
And there is an artist that I pulled, I, I stole this composition from, um, and I've added and adjusted it a lot to make it my own as well. This is a digital artist and I'm trying to find him because <clears throat> this is my digital art photo. If you don't know about ArtStation, I would suggest, you know, regardless if you are a um, traditional artist or a digital artist, especially digital artist, uh, you really could benefit from being on ArtStation. Almost every day I go on there, and, and this is where you have to be careful because every day, and I'm gonna pour some tea in the background so hopefully it doesn't sound weird. Every day I go onto ArtStation, I see amazing artists putting up amazing work. And these are people that are working in industries of game design, and movie design, and environmental design. They're doing, they're working at it for a living. And if you're a hobby artist, if you only, like me, if, if you only have a few hours a day that you can kind of squeeze in because you have work and life stuff, it's very difficult to get to that caliber because you're not putting in the time. But my point is, on ArtStation, there's a ton of uh, just amazing artists that put up work all the time, and they're absolutely amazing. Uh, all traditional artists can learn from them, but the, care the thing you have to be careful about is getting discouraged, right? And comparing yourself to them. Uh, so some tools, some practical ideas to try and stop comparing yourself as much as you can when looking at other artists. I would say number one is understanding where you are. I like the visual of thinking about ladders. You know, everyone has a ladder that they need to climb. You know, they're born and they get on their ladder and they're climbing, right? And your ladder is completely different than anybody else's ladder. You don't know... Um, I mean, no one knows what your ladder's like, how tall it is, where you started from on the ladder, you know. There is an assumption that we all started at the bottom. There's many people that started halfway up the ladder. You know, maybe they have monetary gains that you don't, you know, things like this. Um, I'm just copying these images and I'm putting them onto my mountain scene Krita file. By the way, I'm using Krita. Holy cow, that's a big image. So when you look at these other artists, amazing artists, just think about those ladders and understand that, you know, they're in a different place than you are. Um, it's not about, <clears throat> and this is not about making excuses for yourself. I mean, everybody's got to do the hard work. It's just that um, many people are way ahead of you. Many people are way ahead of me, and they're a lot younger than me. But that doesn't matter. Uh, we all have our own experiences. We're all our own person, and to be comfortable within that. So try not to compare yourself as much as you can uh, to these. Just know that you're on your own ladder. And, and look at these artists, right? And um, celebrate. I look at this artist, I look at Abel Bierstadt, I look at this guy here, oh my gosh, I need to get his name for you, give me one second, <clears throat> or their name, I'm not sure if they're male or female, or anywhere in between, or outside that, it doesn't matter. And I've lost the image, where'd it go? I feel it's important that I attribute <laughs> this artist that I'm working from so that everybody can benefit from their amazing work. I believe this, this person is probably one of the top 
followed artists on ArtStation. Oh, bear with me. Would love to keep this stream as entertaining as possible all the time, but lots of t Oh, here it is. Shin Jong Hun. So S H I N J O N G H U N on ArtStation. Oh, this is Beardstab we're looking at right here, but this is uh, Shin Jong Hun on ArtStation. Okay, Beardstab Shin Jong Hun. So, yeah. Uh, I'm not comparing myself to this person. I know they're way ahead of me in digital art, and that is awesome, because guess what? If they can do it, I can do it. You just gotta put in the time and the effort, okay? It's not about skill, or it's not about talent. Talent just gets you started. Talent is, I like to say that talent's just motivation, right? It's what gets you um, on the path. So don't worry about how great they are. Uh, because guess what? I've heard from and watched so many different artists and they all just say the same thing. Even like the great Craig Mullins, right? He's looking at these younger artists and he's saying, holy cow, they're so much better than I am. So everybody is... Oops, that's the whole thing. How do I mirror a particular layer in Krita? This is a beginner course, so I'm learning things. But everybody, no matter how great you are, is learning. Mirror layer horizontal. There you go. Everybody is learning. Everybody's learning at their own pace. And everybody's always looking at other artists and going, wow, they're so good. <laughs> Just like myself and you and everyone else so don't worry about it okay this is too big one thing i like to do is force myself to make these reference images small okay even smaller come on chris even smaller come on push it push it smaller and the reason why is because um i want to pull the idea of that out uh, I, well, I want to steal the idea. I don't want to copy the painting. Okay? It'd be so much easier just to copy that painting, but we, you know, I have a cliff over here uh, on this side. You can see how, um, or may maybe you can, I'm not sure, but the general composition and what I can do. Let me create a layer just to draw on. Oh, I don't have. I don't have Krita in the right place. Boy, all this stuff I need to do to get prepared for a stream. This is only like my fourth stream, so it's going to take some time for me to get everything together. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, let's look at the, the composition I'm, I'm talking about. So we're over here on Shin Jong Hoon's painting. Okay. And... Maybe I can just zoom all the way in. There you go. So here's the composition. It's just a series of circles. Okay. Like the major idea. And then he has these. Or they have these amazing elements. This. Right? See where that's pointing? Center of interest. Another center of interest. And then we have this amazing line pointing in. This line here. This line here this line here um, even you know the flow here points into the you know these guys down at the bottom even the background we slope and we point I mean it's like all these all these markers that <laughs> are, are leading everybody into the center of interest once you <clears throat> look at composition once you begin to learn composition one thing that you'll start seeing is all of these very simple ideas of how, you know, the artists are just pointing you to what you're supposed to look at. That's our job. We point you to what we want you to look at. We try to make you feel the way that um, we want you to feel. 
I think that's the, the best thing about being an artist is with one image, not 50, not 24 per second, like in a movie, right? But with one image, we have to do the very, very hard work of uh, trying to make a person feel something. And it looks like my mountain drawing got misplaced. That's okay. I love being able to just move a mountain around. There you go, digital art folks. You can move mountains. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so as you can see on that composition, I really stole a lot of the idea of his composition because I have that um, cliff on the left hand side, I got the stream here, and then I got another cliff rolling up, and then I kept this point here, and then I have a center of interest that is very small, uh, just like theirs, it's just one person, and instead of this kind of, as you can see here, he has this really amazing um, gate, you know, it's maybe, I don't know what it is, I think this is for a game or something, but yeah, I, I, I'm not going to do this kind of futuristic fantasy world kind of thing. Uh, I'm bringing it a bit more into reality by um, putting a mountain there instead because I love mountains. Um, so I'm going to look at this and I'm going to piece by piece draw it out or, or you know, draw what I want it to be. Okay, so let's do this. Let's begin drawing. And this is gonna start simply because I know I want my center of interest to be here. Um, this is gonna be a person. So I'm drawing this person in really quickly, just blocking them in. Um, you know, something from reality. Every time we go hiking, we take um, poles, uh, trekking poles, they call them out here in the Pacific Northwest. And I know there's going to be some kind of shadow cast there. So that's my person. But the big thing I want to look at right now is this cliff on the left hand side. And I'm looking at um, Bierstadt. So I got the placement, I got the idea for the composition from Shen Zhang Hun from Art Station. Now I want to look at this particular cliff. See what I can pull from it from Bierstadt. So, stealing a little bit from each one, okay? Kind of combining the two, making something my own. Now, I like the angle of Bierstadt's cliff a bit more. It does this thing, it kind of goes up that way. But it didn't, it also has this kind of interesting shelf at the top. It kind of breaks in. The one thing I want to keep here is this idea of a, a line, a reference line that is pointing to <clears throat> one of my center of interest, which is this person here. I really like the idea, the, the history, at least, you know, the minute by minute history of this person. You know, they've come a you know, they just passed beyond the side of this cliff that's here. And they're witnessing, you know, this awe-inspiring scene. It's a scene at dusk or dawn, doesn't matter which one. Um, and, you know, it should be jaw-dropping, that's what I'm going for. I, I also like this boulder. There's been so many times when me and my wife are hiking and, you know, we're always hiking on mountains here in the Pacific Northwest because it's an absolutely beautiful place. Okay. And every now and then we'll come across this kind of, this boulder that is just sheared off the side of a mountain. And now when I say boulder, I'm thinking you know, something that is so large that, you know, think of like one of the biggest houses you've ever seen. 
and it's the size of that. It's just one big solid piece of granite. This is, you know, immense. I like the words to describe a lot of this, right? It's so, so crazy. Um, I'm gonna use this as my eraser today. One thing I love about Krita, and I've talked about this before, is the fact that you can turn any brush that you're actually that you're currently working with into an eraser just by hitting one button. Can't do that in Photoshop. Uh, I keep bashing Photoshop because I, you know everybody in the industry uses it. Well, the movie industry, gaming industry, because it's just kind of a standard. And um, I really think it's a market thing. But for us artists that don't really have a lot of money, um, it's great to have an amazing painting program that is absolutely free. Krita is absolutely free. And it's fantastic. I mean, I absolutely love it. Okay, so there's some interest in this cliff here. And I'm trying to use a lot of straight lines. It's kind of like, you know, very subtle C curves throughout a lot of this cliff face. Now we're going to keep this cliff face dark, you know, really dark eventually. And hopefully you see what I'm drawing. I'll zoom in a lot more. Eventually this cliff face is going to be really dark. It's going to be pushed back there. It's not the center of interest. It's not the most important thing. So I don't need to go into a tremendous amount of detail with it. But I do want to gain an understanding of what it actually looks like. You know, at least the form. So when I begin to model it, when I begin to model the form, even in a very dark shadow, I have this confidence for um, maybe reflected light or any other type of light that kind of goes up into it. I have to say, I think Shin uh, Jong Hun could learn from Bierstadt on this kind of cliff face. Of course, you, you can kind of hide behind the idea that this is, you know, a fantasy thing, but it's not as naturalistic as Bierstadt's got, um, which I prefer. I mean, of course, you know, any critique of art is ultimately subjective, right? <laughs> you could say you hate it, and you're not wrong. You could say why, and you're not wrong. There's no right and wrong in art. There's just what you like and what you don't like. All right, that's, that's a pretty good start. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna influence that a bit more. How can I do this? One second. I'm actually going to be pulling up a free stock photo site called Unsplash, and I'm getting it um, onto the screen that you can actually see. There you go. So this is Unsplash, and I'm going to look for Cliff. Wow, that's a really crazy Cliff. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing this is because yeah, I want to get a little bit more understanding for that cliff. This is cool because I can pull a lot of what is, you know, um, out of this cliff. What's interesting about this cliff here, let me, let me um, zoom in without going to it. Yeah. I could tell that this is, well, you know, I'm not a geologist, but I'm pretty sure that this is made from uh, lava. These kind of like vertical things going on here. I believe that's formed by lava, but that doesn't really matter now, does it? Let's look at it. Ooh, that's really cool. That a little too uninteresting for me. Maybe that's good because this cliff is not gonna be very interesting. That could be good. Maybe, 
It's got some grass on it. Just getting ideas. Figuring out, you know, something from nature that I can pull from as well. I don't want to be, I don't want it to be exactly like this Beardstat painting, and I don't want it to be exactly like this Shenzhong Yung painting as well. My own influences. And this is another way to get more and more influence. Um, not just from other artists, but from life itself. I mean, I can't travel to these exotic places, so I'm going to be using the stock photos. Let's do this. I'm going to go to, let's say, Shutterstock. Uh, another stock photo site that is not free. Okay, so you have to pay for this. But I'm not, um, I'm not going to be using the images per se. I'm just going to be using some um, influence from these images. Oh, this is interesting. People have just rocks all over the place. That could be cool, uh, useful later. Oh, okay, I wouldn't want to be there, but... You know, maybe I am overthinking this cliff way too much, but I, I just want to at least look into this. Okay, businessman. Never know what you'll see on stock photo site. It's all about discovery for me, I think. Because I could sit here and I could look, you know, at these image, images for an hour and make this the most boring stream in the world, but I'm not going to do that. I just want to kind of peruse around and see if there's anything that really sparks my... There it is. There's some attention there. Now, drawing rocks are really interesting because, hey, let's do this, um, oops. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have to put this onto another screen so you won't see it. But what I like is just, you know, the, the physicality of this rock here. So, or I can do this, you know, save image as, then I'll put it in my mountain scene folder. And then I'm going to go to that mountain scene folder, which you're not seeing right now. It's okay, because I'll get it into Krita right away. Open with Krita. There it is. Uh, control, copy. Nope. Control, copy. Make sure I'm in the right place. Yes. And then I'm going to take this layer, transform, horizontal. Not sure why it goes all the way over there, that's fine. Make it small, small, small. Actually, I... Hmm. Now I'm thinking about it, let's not flip it. Let's bring it back. What I want to do is let's make it small, but then I'm going to stretch the heck out of it. I, I like the idea of just kind of really looking at this rock, because this rock here has fallen off the cliff. But it doesn't, you know, I just... It doesn't really look like a real boulder, so... And this is another thing, I mean, if it just fell off, it's not going to, um, or it's going to have these little chunks and pieces at the bottom of it. So let's do this. I'm right-handed, so when I draw over there, can't see anything. 
covering it up with my arm. All right. So, the form of this rock, that's what I want to kind of get down. Not the entirety, entire idea of this rock, exactly the way it is. It's going to be mine, as all my alarms are going off, to remind me to take my pills. I'm going to take my pills today and every day. Okay. Love the sharpness of this. Probably getting too big with it, and that's okay. There's this little piece here that's... really sharp and rough. I mean, it could be this idea where I make this cliff face really sharp, okay? And <clears throat> very uninviting. That's one thing I learned with uh, the Nathan Folk's um, environmental design course, shape language and, you know, how different shapes can communicate different ideas. So round shapes are happy, they're fuzzy, they're um, nice to people. We like round shapes, they're cuddly. But then sharp shapes are like teeth and claws and things that hurt us. So what I could do is I could make this cliff and these rocks over here really sharp and uninviting and further kind of push that idea that this traveler, this adventurer has come out of a wasteland that was completely uninviting and ultimately hard in the journey, right? I get, you know, how am I going to tell the story that they had a hard journey? Well, this is another one, another way of doing that. I love that this is exactly, I mean, this is a natural formation of rock here. It's really fantastic. Actually, it's interesting, Nathan Folks, his father was a geologist. And <clears throat> he was talking about, during the environmental design class on schoolism, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I have some stuff going on with my throat this morning, I guess. Hopefully I'm not sick. Um, and he loves rocks. I mean, he loves painting rocks. And then, in, I think in one movie he was working on, he's worked on so many different movies over the years, like Disney and DreamWorks and all this stuff. He was known as the rock guy, where he would paint rocks. Okay, so this is, I like the size of it, but it's too close and not separated away from the cliff if not enough. It's too close to my subject and not separated from the cliff enough for, for me. Don't like it. Uh, and I tried to avoid this tangent here. So this is, um, here you go. Here's something you can learn a little bit uh, from what I've learned. Here's how I can pass on some knowledge, yay. So, tangents. Uh, this is from the Society, or no, School of Visual Storytelling. SVS Learn, S, V as in Victor, S, Learn.com. Maybe I could just write it out. Here you go. Uh, w, okay, SVS Learn.com. Okay. This is an amazing source. It's done by. Jake Parker and uh, Will Terry and Jay, uh, what is his name? Something White. Oh man, I can't forget his, I can't remember his name. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But <clears throat> they have this um, these amazing courses online. And one of the courses is all about creative composition. 
and it's I've learned more about composition in that one course, which I took over like maybe 10 or 15 days, um, than I have my entire life. Like it's that good. And Will Terry does it. It's absolutely fantastic. Okay. I would definitely, I would highly, highly, highly recommend it if you're wondering about composition. But one of the aspects of compositions, uh, well, things to avoid within composition <clears throat> that I learned about through that course is tangents and um, what they are and how to avoid them in some way and well in, in your art okay so I'm gonna show you what a tangent is and what I just avoided so I created this this part of the boulder and it has a similar angle to the cliff here now, I almost created a tangent by putting the cliff face going right into it, okay? Now, why is that bad? You're like, well, why is that bad? Well, it, there's a confusion of space there. If I did this line directly into the boulder, you know, it's like an M.C. Escher painting. You know, what is in front of the other? Um, M.C. Escher used all these tangents all the time to confuse people. Uh, so you can go either way. If you want it to be really confusing as far as like depth and everything, you can create tangents. Uh, so something to to continue to look at in your own work and avoid. Okay. So this is um, very interesting rocks here, but it's all going to be in shadow because it's a bit too interesting. I want the center of interest to be on this guy. So I'm going to be using uh, light and shadow to do that. Okay, let's look at Beerstadt again. I'm gonna bring him back over. Come on over, Beerstadt, with your amazing artistry. Not only was this guy amazing artist and painted all this stuff, but he was an adventurer as well. What's interesting about Beerstadt is he literally Literally. Oh, I'm on the wrong layer. Let's do this. Sorry. I painted on the wrong layer, and I don't want that to be there anymore. So i got to remove it. What's interesting is, you know, he lived in New England at the time. I can't remember, you know, what year this was. But this is basically before, um, well, the West was really wild, okay? It hadn't been colonized. Uh, there is lots of indigenous people out there that were, you know, obviously um, angry about a lot of land been, being taken over by um, these settlers coming in and all kinds of craziness there. I'm not going to get into that, but uh, it was not a very um, nice place for people, right? And as an artist, he's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna go out there and I'm going to paint these landscapes. And I'm, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get on my horse and carriage and I'm gonna travel for months because horse and carriage from New England all the way out to Washington State is, you know, gonna take months. <laughs> Not, I mean, heck, I, I drove all the way out from the East Coast to Washington, and it took me five days, and I was going, you know, probably an average of 70 miles an hour the whole time. <laughs> I mean, horse and carriage, two miles an hour, and it's a 2,500 mile journey to get out here, right? So yeah, months. Um, and he traveled and <clears throat> did paintings of the amazing landscapes out here, um, small paintings, and then made the trek back home to New England and started making these just epic mountainous landscapes. Because at the time, you know, rightly so, many people did not want to make that trek out west and risk their lives to see uh, these these amazing spaces 
you know, especially in um, in England at the time. So Bierstadt did really well. He capitalized on what people wanted at the time. They wanted to see what the West looked like. Uh, you know, and like Sargent did with, or John Singer Sargent did with figurative work, with portraits, he made it even more exceptional than it is in real life. So when you see these paintings of the, you know, like Mount Hood or Mount Rainier that's out here, you you will see something that is so much more romantic or romanticized than anything you could actually see, um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest right now. <laughs> so he really capitalized on, you know, what, what the market needed or um, what people wanted, not really the market, but what people wanted. And he gave people that and they loved him for it. I'm pretty sure that uh, Bierstadt made a killing on those paintings. Because not only are they absolutely beautiful, um, but um, yeah, he risked his life to do it. Oh, I got two comments that I missed. I got a guy from Taiwan. Hello from Taiwan. Shen Sun Xu. I'm sorry if I really mispronounced your name, but thank you so much for joining. And another guy, Aver Ron. It looks like he. Oh, the language there. Oh, it's amazing. Anyway, um, I everyone, good seeing you. I need to watch the chat a bit better. It's kind of hard to do when I'm trying to focus on painting and watching the chat at the same time. But I'll get better at it. So I'm looking at you know little small specifics within this amazing cliff that Albert Bierstadt painted. So that's how awesome Bierstadt is. I mean, when's the last time that we risked our life for our artwork, right? <laughs> I mean, that's why we do, I do art because it's not risking my life. <laughs> it's, this is a lot of fun. Although I wonder what art would look like if it was an extreme sport, right? It's like, uh, to Stephen Kotler in his book *The Art of Impossible* and multiple books before that, where he talks about um, extreme athletes that get into a flow state uh, because they're risking their life while they're doing what they love, and they've achieved things that have, that are beyond anything that you could ever imagine because they're in that flow state because they're risking their life. Maybe Bierstadt was in this like ultimate flow state as an artist when he was out there, you know, traveling, avoiding, you know, getting eaten by a panther, um, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever, you know, and, and think about it, like the camping, I mean, today, I mean, camping is luxurious compared to you know, what he had to endure to get out, get out there and just see these beautiful sights. I mean, we do, you know, what they call glamping to the extreme. So it's a combination of words, camping and glamour. So glamour camping, <laughs> that's how I prefer. Heck, I don't even prefer camping. I would just rather, you know, jump into a hotel drive out to amazing scenes or a bed and breakfast and then drive out to amazing scenes and have a great time then go out to dinner right at a restaurant and then head back to a room take a shower go to sleep on a nice bed climate controlled all that kind of stuff yeah that's what i prefer not not as hardcore as albert bierstadt not at all so I'm not understanding well this part of the cliff that he has. Oh, look at that. I just totally distorted that, didn't I? This little part of cliff in there. Not understanding what he's got going on. I blew it up just a little bit. 
Um, and I don't need to get a huge understanding. I'm getting too detailed within this cliff here. So let's, um, let's close it out. That's a top shelf. That's a front plane. That's another top shelf that leads into something here. I'm just establishing kind of like top, side, top, side. Uh, this is a side here. And, you know, this doesn't really work with what I just did, so. Get rid of that line. That will go in deep, deep shadow. Let's say it's a whole cliff face, and then this guy, what am I going to do with this? Let's, because I, I do, you know, one thing I always struggle with is, you know, how far to take these things, because I, I feel that, you know, I could rough this in really quickly. I could use three-dimensional art. I could use all kinds of stuff to get this done really quickly, but sometimes I'm like, wow, I just want to, you know, learn the form of this mountain in some way, or this cliff face. Because this will improve me for everything that I do in the future. And I love that idea. So I'm trying to get, you know, wh where are the planes here? Whoop. Where are the planes happening? So it comes down, let's keep it simple. <clears throat> here, that's where it kind of ends. Let's say that there's a chunk out of it. Right there. Does that even look right? How would that chunk work? Yeah, I'm not keeping this simple. Keep it simple, Chris, come on. There we go. Don't really like the way that looks. There we go. And now for this guy, I'm gonna do something similar. So it's a really repetitive type of, you know, configuration or stylization of this mountain, but. I think it's okay for right now. It's gonna be in very, it's gonna be in shadow. Um, and try not to go for perfection on this anyways. Realizing that, yeah, I'm not going to get this perfect because I could sit here and study this forever. The main, the most important thing is just to get a, a general idea of light and shadow on this and then improve on the next painting. Okay, let's back up. Let's get rid of my reference. Wow. That's a lot. What I'm gonna do is I have an underlayer, my very first layer where I just did a block in. I'm gonna make it even lighter. There we go. Okay, next thing I want to work on is the stone in the front. I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second. Um, I'm looking at some quick reference right here. Okay. Make sure I'm on the, on the correct layer. So the composition that we have for this right here, and I'm gonna refresh it in my memory and in yours as well, is there's this kind of, not ridge, but 
change in the um oh wow my brain just died there uh this is a change in in the pathway so it kind of goes down you know a, a hill or something so i can kind of visualize this if i wanted to get kind of like an idea overview of the whole thing it's like this if you can see that i'm drawing so light there's no way that you can actually see that so so kind of like this and then you know if you saw the other side it would kind of flow down right um so that's what i'm going for now the the light the shaft of light is this way it hits our main character it kind of flows in so this is all light in here and this is all dark um, but one element that i really like from shin jung hoon's nope that's beard stat um where is he at there he is one element that i really like from this and and i've emphasized with my initial drawing is this little let me zoom in this little um rock here because it uh, kind of stops the viewer's eye. You know, it kind of breaks off uh, the viewer from, you know, going this way and out of the composition. It's like, no, stop. Look at, look at over here, over here, okay? So it's another compositional element. And I have that boulder or something similar to it right here. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw... A realistic looking boulder there and I just looked at boulder on Shutterstock and some amazing photographer just took this picture of a rock a big old rock thank you whoever you are because I'm gonna use this in a painting that hopefully will change someone's life or influence someone in some way because um, your your photo photograph has influenced me thank you looks like my stream is going really slow right now sorry for any connection issues can't I don't have a lot of control over that, unfortunately. I've tried to do everything I, I, can, I can to optimize this stream, so it sounds good for everyone. But eh, it's 4.22 in the morning. I wouldn't expect that there would be a lot of people awake and on the internet right now, but you never know. Actually, I'm going to take this all the way back because I don't like the placement of it. And I don't have it on a separate layer, so I need to do it this way. Not utilizing the digital uh, system as well as it could be. If I put that on a different layer, I could just have easily moved it. But it was going over my rock in the background, my boulder in the background, and I didn't want that to. I want. I didn't want to mess with that. So. Here we go. It goes this way. I do love working from nature. And the, the, the wonderful thing about nature is it's perfectly random. I mean, absolutely. Like, there's nothing in nature. You know, if we drew nature, if I draw a tree, and you can see this all the time, you'll see, um, and heck, look at my work. There's probably a lot of, well, I know, there's a lot of artists out there that have drawn trees and plants and whatever, and you look at it and you go, you know, that doesn't look quite like a tree, right? But then you look at nature, at all these trees and things, and they make the most random looking things. But then everyone, you know, you go, oh, that's a tree. That's definitely a tree. Yeah, it's not a type of tree that I've ever seen before, but that is a tree. And that's the cool thing about um, nature. It doesn't matter 
what it does, it's right. I think, you know, I'd like to get to a point in my art, or get us all to a point in our art where everything we do, it doesn't matter what we do, it's right. It's right for right now. It's okay for what we're doing right now. All right, there's my boulder, okay. And let's do this. Let's angle it. Actually, no, see, I, what I could do is I could utilize that line to further point to um, my center of interest. So instead of, you know, going this way and saying it, you know, it, it may be, um, maybe it fell from really high and it buried itself, you know, in the, in, in the, uh, the soil or something, or maybe it's just been there for millennia, right? Um, instead of doing that line, I'm going to do, um, a line on it that maybe this is a different rock here. Hmm. can make this easier by just chopping it off like that. And I still have the line that I wanted. Okay. So that's pointing at my center of interest. Okay. Getting rid of those lines in the background or behind this boulder somewhat. It's really messing with the, the overlapping that I want to see. Yeah, I like that. That's nice. So I've been going for an hour and a half, well, probably about an hour right now. And I think that's long enough for the stream. Um, but what I want to do is kind of a, a recap on this. So the idea at the beginning today was to really begin to redraw this whole mountain scene because um, I made one of the biggest mistakes that I make that I've made before when doing my art is, is not figuring out the entirety of the drawing before I actually get started. I did this huge block in and then as I got into getting into details I was like well I really don't know what this mountain looks like or how um, or the form of it in some ways and so I had to you know, start over on the mountain. And then that kind of grew. I realized, wow, I need to start over on everything because I don't know the form of anything here. Um, but while I'm talking, I'm going to get in some quick idea of composition that I want to try and play out, however that plays out. But what I'm trying to correct today is, you know, the redraw, the, the next understanding or further understanding of what's happening here. And I know I want to do this kind of lake thing here, right? Trees over there, some mountains in the far, far distance, way, way, way back there, however they look like. And so today was about, you know, beginning and getting started on redrawing this whole thing. And getting a better understanding of the entirety of this piece. Uh, so that when I get into value, light, color, and details, I'm not guessing. And this piece has taken tremendously long 
because I didn't do that at the beginning. Um, so yeah, I learned and what I'm going to do is make sure that I don't make that mistake again because this is what it's all about. Um, we're, it's all about learning 1% every single day. This is why I'm doing daily art every day. This is why I have done daily art for 3,603 days consecutively. If I can get 1% better every single day, then, you know, after 10 years, I look at my art now and how it's grown. I've been, I've, you know, I'm so much better than I used to be. And the minimum that I do is 30 minutes a day, every single day, no matter what. And I've done a lot more than that on a lot of days, but there's been weeks and months where it's just nothing but 30 minutes a day. Actually, this painting right here of Patrick, let me see, can I point correctly? Yeah, this is Patrick here, this painting in the background. And that took me 141 sessions to complete because I didn't feel like painting for the, for the months I was working on that, 141 months, or 141 days, how many months is that? I don't know. But it it averaged around 30 minutes a session. I would just, I don't feel like painting, but I'm going to get my 30 minutes in. I'd work on a section of it, put my, my brushes back in, you know, the soak, and then do it again tomorrow. Constantly, you know, making that little step forward. So after 3,600 days, uh, getting close to 10 years, I'm still doing it and it's helped me out tremendously. Um, and my channel's all about how to do that. So I'm rambling now, and yeah, thanks for joining me at the stream. Check out my channel, like, subscribe, do all that kind of stuff if you want to. If not, that's cool. But join me every morning. I'm gonna be here Pacific time at like 3 a.m., around 3 a.m. every single morning, and sharing my daily art journey with you. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.